Good morning. morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. It's a blessing to be with you all this morning. It's a little bittersweet though. As most of you know, this is our last Sabbath here at Waitara. And it's the last time I'm going to be preaching at Waitara, or at least as a pastor of Waitara. I hope it's not the last sermon I ever get to preach at this church. But what an amazing program we've had so far, amen? Amen. We have some very talented musicians, singers. Um, One of the beautiful things about music is, is that it crosses intergenerational times, right? You can have a a, a senior person with a younger person or in the middle, and they can come together and play music and sing together. It's such a beautiful thing to see when that happens. So, yeah, I'm going to miss you guys. (laughs) It's been a crazy year, hasn't it? Something that most of us never expected to live out, at least in our life, to see the world change so rapidly, to see so many things happen so quickly and change the way we live and the way we do life and the way we interact with one another. There's been many blessings this year and there's been many trials and hardships at the same time. And for most of us, you know, this time of the year is a a great time to celebrate, to come together. We enjoy it. The food is good. Amen? Amen. Who likes to eat Christmas dinner? I know I like Christmas dinner. Look forward to it every year. But there are some people in our community that are doing it tough. And so I want to encourage you, if you know anyone who you feel may be alone this holiday season or may be going through a tough time, reach out to them. You never know how a word of uh, encouragement could really uplift someone's spirits. And that's what we are called to do during this time. I'm going to share a a sermon, a message with you this morning. It's titled, What Does It Mean For You? I want you to think about that title as we go through the message today. What does it mean for you? Now, it's a Christmas message because it's Christmas Day. And it's that time of the year. There's a famous song that goes, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Who knows that song? It's an oldie but a goodie. And I don't know like, about you, but for me personally, even though I'm getting older in my, in my years, every time it's getting close to Christmas, I start to feel a little bit like a child again. Does anybody have that experience? Even though I know that it's not going to be anything like when I was a child because now I'm a parent. You see, as a parent... We have to look after everything. We have to organize everything. We have to prepare everything. We have to clean everything. And really, we don't even get any presents anymore. It's all about the kids now. But there's something about this time of the year when the weather starts getting hot, when you start hearing the Christmas carols in the stores, when you start seeing Christmas trees go up. There's something magical about this time of the year that brings back good memories. Well, at least it does for me, and I'm conscious of the fact that for some it may not. But it's Christmas time, and today happens to be Christmas Day. Now, I know as well, and I understand, that there are some amongst us that don't like the celebration of Christmas because we understand that the Bible doesn't say anything about Jesus being born on the 25th of December, And some of us like to go and study history and realize that Christmas, at least when it comes to the 25th of December, has more pagan origins than it does Christian origins. And so some of us can turn into a bit of a Scrooge this time of the year and not want to celebrate Christmas and not want anyone else to celebrate Christmas. But, you know, Jesus tells us in the the Bible that we should be wise as serpents. Harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. And one of the things that I personally have come to to believe and understand, and I know many of you have as well, is that this happens to be a time of the year where many people are actually willing to listen to some kind of message about God. And if we as people of the book, and if we as those who believe we have the truth of God, and we know and we understand the gospel, This time of the year is one of those times where we should be proclaiming the loudest that Jesus came to save us from our sins. 
And that's what I hope I'm going to be able to do with you this morning. Now, I want to start off by sharing a few Old Testament prophecies that speak about the coming of the Messiah. Because one of the things that we understand that we look at in Christmas time is Jesus coming to this world to be born as a baby. But what I want us to do today is to focus on the question as to why he came. But specifically, I want you to then take that question as to why he came, and I want you to think about this one. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for you that Jesus came into this world? If we go to the book of Genesis, we find in Genesis the very first, at least as we understand it, prophecy about the coming Messiah. Genesis 3.15, it's, a, it's an amazing verse. It's, it's very deep, this verse, because this is the conversation really that God is having with Satan after the temptation and fall in the Garden of Eden. And when God finally speaks to Satan, because first he speaks to Adam, and when he basically goes to Adam and says, Adam, what did you do? Adam turns around and blames who? It was the woman. She made me do it. Then God goes to the woman and he says, what happened, Eve? What does Eve do? She then blames the serpent. God finally speaks to the serpent, and this is what he says. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is actually one of the most profound verses in all of the Bible when I came to understand the fact that God is saying to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. We need to understand, though, to get a proper understanding of this, what this verse means. Who is the woman? Prophetically, the woman represents what? The church. It's God's people. And so God is saying to Satan, I will put enmity between you and my people. That's profound. I don't know if you, 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 you got that because that, that implies that naturally there is no enmity between God's people and Satan. God's people and sin. So God has to put that enmity there. And he says between your seed and her seed. Now, who is the seed of the woman that God is speaking about here in this verse? It's Jesus Christ. And this is the very first prophecy that we get of Jesus in the whole scripture. And it said that he will bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent will only be able to bruise his heel. In other words, when it's all said and done, the seed of the woman will be more powerful, will be more victorious and will accomplish more than the seed of the serpent. And so that's the very first prophecy we get of Jesus in the Old Testament. And I just want to share a couple more. I, I don't want to focus too much on this, but there's a couple more that are very important. Isaiah mentions the coming Messiah quite a lot. And in Isaiah 7:14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we're going to read from the New Testament soon. And in the New Testament, it tells us what Emmanuel actually means. But here we see the prophecy of Jesus being born through what is understood to be that miraculous conception from a virgin. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Just reading something like this, you, you, you can't help but start to understand a little bit as to how excited the disciples must have felt when they realized that their rabbi, their leader, their teacher was the Messiah that the scriptures would speak of. What he would accomplish, what he would do for his people and how his government, once established, will bring forth a peace of which there will be no end. 
And you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, this is something that we long for. We can't wait for the day when Jesus comes back, where everything on this earth changes, where all the bad things that are experienced and felt and suffered come to an end. And from that moment on, it will be peace, the peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding, and there will be no end to that peace. So these are just a few of the scriptures, and there are many that you can go into the Old Testament and look at that speak about Jesus. But I want to take us to Matthew chapter 1. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to read the Christmas story. And as you're making your way to Matthew chapter 1, for those that are able, I just invite you to bow your heads with me, and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, in, at this moment, Lord, we are about to open your word to really try to see you clearly, Lord, in a way that we pray and ask will be transformational to us. So, Lord, please speak to us. Help us to understand the importance of what this whole Christmas story means, but specifically what it means for us. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we go to Matthew chapter 1, it starts off in verse 18 by saying, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. This is a, a reality that many people in this world have a problem with. Have you ever spoken to someone that finds this ridiculous? Ever had a chat with an atheist or someone who's not a believer and they bring about this argument as to how can you be crazy enough to believe this? Well, let me tell you something. The fact that I'm standing here in a pulpit this morning, preaching a sermon, wearing a blazer and a tie, I might add, is just as crazy as this. Because if you would have known me 10 years ago, you would have thought, no way this guy will ever be a pastor, a preacher, or anything like that. What I have seen God do in my life is miracles. God is able to do the impossible. And when we look at the Christmas story, we are reminded of that fact. It seems crazy to the world, but for those of us that know God, we know that there is nothing that God cannot do. So this woman Mary was found to be so special that she was chosen for this amazing, amazing experience and responsibility. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. This is the seed of the woman that we read about in Genesis 3.15. Mary had that seed now inside of her womb. The story gets interesting though. And I like, I like what happens next. It says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away Secretly. Why did Joseph do this? Why did Joseph think to do such a thing? You see, Joseph and Mary had not come together yet in marriage or cons they hadn't consummated their marriage yet. And so Joseph knew that Mary was pregnant, but the baby wasn't his. But the Bible says he was a just man. That implies that he was a good man. He was a righteous man. And so he ends up doing something that, let's be honest, most men would not do. He puts her away secretly so that no one would be able to think or say anything negative about his Mary. Does that indicate love for this woman? It indicates not just love, but it's that kind of fairy tale love, isn't it? Joseph was a good guy, but I need to tell you something. Even though Joseph was a good guy and Joseph did a good thing, Joseph was bothered by it. Why? Because Joseph was a man. Like any one of us, the reason why we know he was bothered, because verse 20 says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, 
You see, Joseph does the right thing. He doesn't understand what's going on, though. Now, Mary must have told Joseph what happened. An angel came and spoke to me, and the angel said that this was going to happen, and I've been chosen by God, and this whole thing is a God thing. It, it, and, and, you know, it's like Mary is trying, Joseph, I, I, I didn't cheat on you, man. I, 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 I've been faithful to you. Imagine having to tell your husband, ladies, I'm pregnant. The child is your, not yours, but I didn't do anything wrong. The Bible says that even though Joseph did the right thing and he put her away secretly so no one would think or say anything bad about her, the Bible does say, though, while he thought about these things, and it's Obvious that these things were bothering him because an angel had to come to Joseph to calm him down, to, to make sure that he didn't stress out about this. The Bible says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel had to come and basically let Joseph know that what Mary had told him was the truth. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Sometimes we read this book in a way that's not personal to us. We read about stories that happened so long ago, but they happen to other people that are not like us. At least that's what we think sometimes. I don't like to read the Bible that way. When I read the Bible and I'm looking at stories of characters in the Bible, I try to find similarities between those characters and myself. Because you know what that does for me? It helps me to relate to those characters. I'm looking at Joseph here and I can relate to this brother. He was a good guy. But it was bothering him that his woman or wife-to-be was pregnant and he knows that he wasn't the one that made her pregnant. So I can see how it's stressing him out a little bit and I can relate to that because as a guy, we would probably be doing the same thing. But what's beautiful about this story is that God sees us in the middle of our confusions. He sees us in the middle of our stressful moments, in times where we don't understand. And what God seeks to do in those moments is to bring clarity and truth to us so that we may be able to move forward in faith. That's what he's doing for Joseph. He brings the angel. And Joseph is not just told that what is going on with Mary is of the Holy Spirit. But then the angel goes forward and says, listen. That son which she's going to bring forth, which is ultimately going to be your son as well. You are going to have the responsibility to raise this boy as a father. You are going to be his earthly father. But you need to understand that this boy is not just going to be any boy. This boy, his name is going to be Jesus. And he is going to save his people from their sins. What a responsibility. And then he goes on to say, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, and we read this in Isaiah, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And now we get the translation, Emmanuel, which means God with us. What a beautiful insight into the God that we serve. So many people throughout history have had this view and idea of God as being some distant entity. That maybe he created this world, but he, he's not close to us. He doesn't feel what we feel. He doesn't understand what we go through. He's up there in heaven somewhere doing his own thing, while the rest of us are down here living in this messed up world. But you see, the Bible tells us that that is not the God that created us. The Bible tells us that God didn't just create us, but he created us specifically for the purpose of relationship. That was the reason why he created us, to love us and to be with us. This is the reason why when, the, you know, as a husband and wife, we leave our parents and we come together and then we have children. We have children for that very reason. 
to love, to protect, to have a relationship with. But there was another reason why God wanted to be with us. And it was because of the condition that we found ourselves in. The Bible tells us that we have all sinned. That we all fall short of the glory of God. And because we have all sinned, the Bible says that the consequences, the wages of our sin is what? It's death. And so when the Bible says that Jesus will be here and he will come here to save his people from their sins, ultimately his mission and purpose is to save us from the consequences of our sin. To take those consequences upon himself. The story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. But I love what it says in verse 10. It says that the Son of Man has come to this earth. He has come here to seek and to save that which was lost. Now remember, what's the title of the message this morning? Does anyone remember? What does it mean for you? Keep that question in your mind as we proceed. I want to share one more scripture with you in John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the, be in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. I remember the very first time I, I read these verses. It blew my mind to realize that Jesus, because when we go down to verse 14, and we'll come there in a moment, it reveals that He is the Word. That Jesus was the one who created the world. Sometimes we have this idea that Jesus didn't come into existence. And I've, I've had conversations with a number of kids about this. They, they, they have this, this, this idea, and sometimes even adults too, that Jesus really didn't come into existence until he was born in that manger at Christmas time. The Bible tells us that before that happened, Jesus was already there. That's why when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, he said to them, before Abraham was, he said, I am. He's always been there. He was there in the beginning. He made everything. Nothing that was made, nothing that was created, the Bible says, was created without him. It says in verse 4, in him life and the life was the light of men. Sorry, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then it says in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's a beautiful verse. It says the word. The one who was there from the very beginning. The one who created everything. The one who the Bible says knows how many hairs we have on our head. Even if we're losing some of that hair, he still knows. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Something he did not have to do. But what we have come to understand is that the ultimate motivating factor behind Jesus coming into this world was love. And we often think about the purpose of Jesus coming into this world. And we always think about that purpose with regards to the fact that he came to save us from our sins and the consequences from our sins, which is true. That is why Jesus came. But Jesus didn't just come to save us from the consequences of sin. Jesus also came into this world to offer us a better life. To become transformed into his likeness. John 3.16 tells us this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus' coming to this earth was with a purpose and that purpose was to ultimately sacrifice himself for you and me. The Bible says that because of what Jesus did, anyone 
has the opportunity to be saved. That if you just believe in what he has done for you, if you believe it with all your heart, if you believe it in a way that transforms and changes you, you will not perish but have everlasting life, a gift that we don't deserve. So Jesus came to dwell among us. He came to save us from our sins. The Father loved us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, that if any one of us believe, we will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, so many times we hear these things, but we hear them thinking about how this applies to other people. Jesus came to save everyone. But can Jesus save someone like me? Jesus gave his life for everyone. But would Jesus give his life for someone like me? Someone as sinful, as messed up, as prone to fall back into sin as me? What I'm going to share with you now, and I want to finish this off with a final thought. Because remember... I want to ask you this morning, what does all of this mean for you? That Jesus came to this world, that he came to dwell among us, that the prophecies were fulfilled, that he came to save his people from their sins, that if we believe in him, we will not perish and ha but have everlasting life. I want you to ask yourself the question this morning, church, what does this mean for you? And I hope we can answer that question by looking at, for me, what for me is the ultimate Christmas verse. And it's not one of the normal Christmas verses that you probably hear, but it's found in the book of 1 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. One of the most profound things that the Apostle Paul said. For me, this is the ultimate Christmas verse, and it answers the question, what does this all mean for me? And I hope it helps you answer the question this morning, what does this mean for you, that Jesus came into this world? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. The Apostle Paul says this, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. This moment, right now, forget about everyone else and think about what it means for you personally that Jesus came into this world. You see, the Apostle Paul dwelt on this question. He thought about it. And the conclusion that he came to was this. And he said that this was so profound that it was not only a faithful saying, but it was worthy of all acceptance. You know what that means? It means you need to accept this no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past, no matter what your background, no matter where you come from. This is worthy of all acceptance by everyone who has ever come through into this world. Everyone. And it's this. That Jesus came into this world. He left glory. He left majesty. He basically degraded himself becoming a human being. And he did that. Why? To save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, sometimes we may think we're better than others. But the reality is, brothers and sisters, that we're not. We're not better than anyone else. Every single one of us is a sinner. Every single one of us is in need of salvation. Every single one of us has weaknesses. We have propensities for certain sins. We are unfaithful to God at times. We do not live up to that standard that we wish we could, that we want to so badly. But you see, that's not a bad thing in and of itself because being reminded of this reality should keep us focused and dependent on our need for Christ. When I'm reminded constantly of how short I am, how short, sorry, I fall. I'm not that short. I know I'm Hispanic and, you know, traditionally we're known to be quite small. But when I'm constantly reminded of how short I fall, 
it brings me back to my knees. I gotta tell you, I got, my, my daughter, she played violin here today. This is probably the biggest crowd she's played in ever. She was very nervous. I was having a chat with her before because she was nervous. And rightly so, I would be terrified too. But I was saying to her, I say, you know what? You're going to play your violin today. You're not doing it for the church. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for Jesus. And one of the things that you need to understand, and I shared this with her, I said, the same way as daddy goes and preaches every Sabbath. I can't do this without Jesus' help. I am not worthy to preach the word of God. We do this because of what he's done for us. But we need to ask him, please help me. Help me to do this. I've been preaching for many years. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> this morning, just even making my way here, it was hard for me. It was hard for me. And my wife can tell you because she's with me every Sabbath as I'm on my way to whatever church it is to preach. How there's just something like not right with me. I'm more quiet than normal. I'm kind of like in my own little world. And my wife always asking me, are you okay? What's wrong? And I always say the same thing to her. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go preach now. And I just, I don't feel worthy to step in that pulpit. I will never feel worthy. But you see, I've come to realize that that's a good thing. Because God forbid the day that I stand up here proudly thinking I am worthy. That's why I see someone like Paul, who is someone we look up to so much, who is a man who wrote most of the New Testament. Paul is one of the, the people that we get doctrine from. And Paul we would think is such a righteous, such a holy person. Paul would be the first to stand up here and he would say, I am a worse sinner than any of you. He says, Jesus came into this world to save sinners of who I am chief. That for me is the most beautiful Christmas message of all. Because it tells you, it doesn't matter how much you've messed up doesn't matter how much you struggle. doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus came into this world to save a miserable wretch just like us. That gives me hope and encouragement. So I want you to think about that this morning. What does it mean for you personally that Jesus came into this world? Think about it in the context of your struggles. Think about it in the context of your weaknesses. Think about it in the context of how you keep messing up at times. In the context of your unfaithfulness. In the context of your unworthiness. Think about it. What does it mean that Jesus came into this world? Sometimes I get to this point where I feel like I'm not going to make it to heaven. Has anyone felt like that before? I'm not going to make it. I can't. How can God take me to heaven? I picture heaven, everyone's just perfect. <laughs> and I look at me and I'm like, oh. But then I, remember, I have to remind myself, it's not about what I think. It's not about what I say. It's about what he says. The Bible says his name is Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I need to remind you this morning, church, you are his people. He came to this world to save you. I'm reminded when I look at Philippians 1.6, which is my, my, my verse, and if there's any verse that I can leave this church with, Hopefully, having ingrained into your minds, it's Philippians 1 6. 
He who has begun a good work in you, he will finish that work. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Ask yourself the question this morning. Has Jesus begun a good work in you? I need to tell you that the very fact that you're sitting here this morning is evidence that that work has begun. He promises that he will complete it. You can't complete it. But he can and he will. What does it mean for you? I hope and pray that you are encouraged by this message as you meditate on the fact that, yes, Jesus came into this world. But he came into this world to save a sinner like me. Like me. May God bless you.